Welcome to First Presbyterian Church in Trenton this morning. Thank you for coming to worship God with us today. There are announcements in our bulletin that are important to the life of the church. Please read the announcements. One uh, such announcement that I've been asked to bring to your attention is the meat sale, the upcoming meat sale here. Please sign up to purchase meat on the sheets on the bulletin board out in the hallway. Uh, it's going to be pre-sale, so you have to order it in advance. Please sign up out in the hallway. And also, please read the other announcements in the bulletin as well. Would you please stand and join me in our call to worship this morning? How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. As Christians, we like to recite what we believe. Join me as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He descended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. Our scripture today comes from 1 John, the chapter 1, and the second verse in chapter 2. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The Word of Life. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we've seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we've seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. God is light. This is the message we've heard from God and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we're walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Christ our advocate. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We often come before the Lord seeking his forgiveness and pardon. So let us now take a moment and confess our sins first silently and then corporately as we come before him seeking his mercy. Let us pray. Now let us pray together. Almighty Father, we worship and praise you, seeking to be worthy of your holy counsel, yet we fall short of the perfection you require, finding it impossible to obtain righteousness on our own. Have mercy on us, restore us, forgive us, heal us. We pray in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen and Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is true that each one of us on our own and we collectively have all fallen short of God's glory. We are sinners in a sinful world and our holy and righteous God would be right to have no accord with us. He would be right to condemn us. And yet in his divine mercy and wisdom, in his love, he does not leave us in such a lowly state, but he has sent us the remedy that we could not gain for ourselves. He sent Christ Jesus into this world, and therefore him dying in our stead, won for us our salvation. In his, re in his resurrection, we are guaranteed part and parcel with God in his kingdom to come, and his kingdom as it will be established upon earth. So hear and believe the good news this very hour. Through Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. Amen and amen. Now I invite the children to come forward for our time with you.
the store. Well, I didn't buy it. Mr. Robin bought something special at the store. It's a can of air. Seems kind of funny to go to the store and buy a can of, can of air. It doesn't it, right? You know, you don't think that's funny? I think it's funny that you purchase, you have to pay a lot of money for a can of air, but anyway. But you know what? There's certain things that you got to have a can of air for. It's like, you want to clean your computer and your keyboard because it gets all dusty? You can't get, like, soap and water and get in there and clean. You have to get spray it with air and the air blows the dust out. But I'm going to let some air out. Did you see? No, I didn't. Did you see it? I didn't either. If we can't see it, how do we know what's in there? Mr. Robin, do they sell us an empty can? You think? I don't know. Let's try again. Ooh, wait. Something different happened that time. It did. I still couldn't see it. Wait, I'm going to. I'm going to. But I can see it. It's going on my hand. Y'all want me to blow it on your hand? forgot to make an announcement um, that is important to the body of the church. Today, um, by reaffirmation of faith, Bill and Virginia Long rejoined our church officially and made their profession. So I would invite you to... Browning. Brown, I'm sorry. Browning. Okay. You know, I'm apt to make at least three mistakes per Sunday. So at least I've gotten hopefully one of them out of the way now. I like to get them done before the sermon because that's when it really counts. But um, Bill Browning be along. Uh, please, after the service, greet them and welcome them back into fellowship. Even though they've been fellowshipping with us, like I told the session, they officially joined, but let's face it, we are all part of God's body as soon as he calls us to be that. So we are all under his care. Just now, they, now they're they putting their hats here and have, have a hook put up for them. So again, welcome them and thank them and let's give them a round of applause real quick. 
Well, God bless you. As Christian people, we believe in the power of prayer. We have compiled a list of people that we have specifically want to pray for. Each Sunday school class has turned this list in. So we're going to do this collective prayer. And when I read the list, you will have the opportunity to add names if there's someone that you want to put on there. Robert Mackin, Shirley Lawler, Shirley Tucker, Martha Henson, Harry Edcock, the family of Dot Hickerson, Demetra Hickerson, Sherry Petty, Dorothy Ray, Madison Hardy, Mark Crocker, Michael Crenshaw, Jira Crockett Robertson, Darla Tucker, Brett Wyatt, Janice Robertson, Terry Glenn, Artie Quinnan, Julie Oates, Carrie Temple, Brenda Reagan, David Temple, James Wright, Harold Swindle, and we have three unspokens. Are there others that you'd like to put to this list? Susan Rice. Susan Rice. Chad Taylor. What was that? Chad Taylor. Chad Taylor? Yeah. Chad? Yes. Are there others? The family of James Neal. James Neal. The family of James Neal. Family of James Neal. Sherry Fisher. Carrie. Sherry. Sherry Fisher. Mark Hudson. And Don Allen. Sherry Fisher, Mark Hudson, and Don Allen. Others. The family of Matt Griffin. Family of Matt Griffin. Are there others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. Father, we know that you can do all things. We come to you this morning with these concerns. Friends, family, acquaintances. Each one with a different situation that they're in. We just pray, Father, that you will make your presence known to them. We pray, Father, that you will cure them. You will heal them. We pray, Father, that you will comfort the families who have suffered losses. We pray that you will be with the caregivers. We pray that you will give them strength. And we just pray, Father, that you would help us to understand that your will will be done. And we may not always understand it, but it's your will and it will be done. So we thank you, Father, for all the blessings. And we just pray, Father, for these needs. We also pray, Father, for people who aren't listed this morning. People that you know about their concerns already. People who are suffering. People who have needs. We just pray that you will be with them also. Father, we know that this prayer works. You taught us to pray. And you taught us the Lord's Prayer. Follow the Lord's Prayer with me, please. Oh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
now invite you to bring forward the gifts of your eyes and your offering. <laughs> Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your tender mercies and your daily provisions that you bestow upon us daily. We ask now that our worship will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen. It's great to have them back, isn't it? Today our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of John. We'll be reading from the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 31. Again, that is John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. I invite you now to stand for the reading of the gospel message. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of nail in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. Reach out your hand, and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that through believing in him, you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. To God. Amen. Well, again, I say to you, Happy Easter. He is risen. All right. You know, sometimes I do that just so I can tell my uh, fellow ministers that I can actually get my congregation to talk back to me. <laughs> so they say, what, a bunch of Presbyterians talking in church? I said, well, technically we're in the fellowship hall right now, but I'm hoping to keep them going when we get back to the sanctuary. Um, but it is the continuation of Easter. Easter is a season in the church. Now, granted, the big day, Easter Sunday, was last Sunday, and, and, and that's a great day to look forward to, Holy Week. And the whole season of Lent builds up to it. And you have Resurrection Sunday. But then it's something that is so big and so huge that we are compelled, driven, hopefully inspired, to continue along that thread, to continue focusing on the Easter message for many weeks. Also, the story really is too big to get done in just one Sunday. I mean, if I had to give you the entire Easter sermon, well, let's put it this way. We'd have had to take a break for lunch and come back. And you know what? I don't know many churches, although I have been in a few that would, would do that. You know, worship four or five hours on a Sunday. See, when I go a little bit long, you think it's bad. Look, I've been places where not only one person preached, he got done, he inspired somebody else, they got preached too. Then the first preacher felt doubly inspired, I guess, or in competition. He preached again. So, I'm just saying, you know, sometimes we think the other side is greener, but, you know, you get there and you find out, you know, there's only one paradise that is better than you think it is, and that is the one we are destined to go to because of Easter. But again, it's the Easter message and it's the Easter story. And, of course, that story is one that begins with the passion. That begins as darkness enters into the teachings. Jesus came teaching peace and love and unity. And for it, he was crucified. For our sins, he was called to sacrifice. And that, although we call it Good Friday, 
is a sad day in the church is one that marks and should cause each of us to feel a little bit uncomfortable for each of us has something to do with that for even if the rest of the world were without sin just one of us sinning Christ would have come and paid the price of course I find that a lot of hope in that statement because I can't tell what you've done in your lives but I know there are several things in my life that I have needed Christ to come and atone for to heal me of I don't say this glibly I, I, I remember the very first time I watched the movie The Passion of the Christ um, it was the most gut-wrenching couple of hours I've ever seen and while I like to pretend that I am strong and you know I'm, it, at the time when I watched it I w had been in the military for a while and so nothing ever bothered me you know you, you can have your arm dangling there and you go just a flesh wound I'll get by just give me a couple of Motrin and wrap it up but I tell you when I left that theater I felt so sad so completely wrecked and I'll admit it there were a few lines down my face where my eyes had leaked during parts of that. Notice I didn't say cry. But it was true. I wept. Remembering the sorrow. But as moving as that was. I rejoiced. The next day because. I remembered that is not the end of the story. That is part of the story. That is sort of the beginning of the end. Or the transfer of what was Christ came into the world to teach us of God's love. He showed us God's love and then he comes back and so the next day we get the women going to the tomb. The next day we get the disciples running when they hear that the stone was rolled away. The next day they begin to get an inkling of what they've been told all along and that is that he is risen. Now unlike us who know what to say when we hear that they weren't sure. What does this mean? Even though they had been told many times what that was going to happen. That the Son of Man would be handed over and tortured and beaten and eventually crucified and laid in the tomb. But that he would rise again on the third day. But on the third day they weren't ready for it. On the third day they still expected to mourn the loss of their Lord. But the light began to break into the darkness. The gloom began to dissipate and Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene and told her to go to my brothers and tell them what you've seen. She goes and tells them. Now that is where we ended last Sunday. And this Sunday we pick up on that. And when she went and told them, they rejoiced immensely, right? I mean, wouldn't you? Last Sunday when you came here and I pronounced it is Easter, he is risen. Did your hearts not skip a little bit of a beat? But you see, that's because we've had time to warm up to the idea. We've been vested in this. We've been helped to understand it. These particular people were still kind of stuck in their mourning and grief. They were still a prisoner. As a matter of fact, what does it say about the room they were in? It was locked. And why was it locked? They're scared of the Jews. Did they have a reason to be scared of the Jews? Well, absolutely. They had just killed the man they thought was the Messiah, the Son of God. And if they could do that to him, surely they would not be able to survive persecution. And so they hid and they cowered. Even though the light was beginning to shine, even though they were beginning to be told the good news of the resurrection, they still couldn't get their minds around it. And so then Jesus appears to them. And says, peace be with you. Now, for many of us we read that, and I oftentimes read that, and you think, well, you know, that's a pretty common greeting with Jesus. I mean, he, but you know what, it, it wasn't just a greeting. I mean, think about it, these people are locked in a room and scared. I think if Jesus didn't start the conversation with peace be with you, there might have been some uh, disciple-shaped holes in the wall as they fled. They wouldn't have quite been able to grasp it. But Jesus is always a step ahead of them. Jesus is always helping to prepare. And so he appears to them. And he shows them the marks in his hands. He shows them his side. And then he goes on. He doesn't stay for very long. 
And of course, Thomas, what do we call Thomas? They call him the twin in the scripture. But who do we think of Thomas as? The doubter. Which, you know, it's not really fair. Because before the first visit, the rest of the disciples were doubters too. It's just that they were there when he showed up and appeared to them. Thus helping to spell a little bit of that doubt. And so what happens with Thomas really isn't so much about Thomas as it is specifically personalizing the experience of meeting the risen Christ for the first time. And so Thomas voices what the disciples were thinking before that first visit. If I do not see him, if I cannot verify that that is the risen Lord, then I am not going to believe. And quite frankly, we are told throughout Scripture that when someone prophesies or speaks in God's name, are we called to just follow along willy-nilly? Or are we called to verify what they say as is written in the Scriptures? Verify, yeah. I guess that's have saying in the military. In God we trust. All the rest we, we verify. Trust but verify. Well, Jesus then begins to open up the text to them. He shows them. He begins again, like it said in 1 John, you know, God is light. And what does light do? It dispels darkness. It illuminates. But I can tell you, um, as someone who has been in some very unique places in my life, um, I remember on one particular trip that the U.S. Navy offered me, we spent about uh, two and a half months underneath the ocean. And when we finally came up, we came up in the Bahamas. And it was a beautiful sunny day in the Bahamas. But let me tell you something. If you've been in artificial light and darkness for two and a half months, it's not beautiful. It's painful. We could barely open our eyes. It looked like little mole men coming out of the sewers or something just squinting around. So I think what we get is God is this bright and brilliant light, but he knows there are times when he must slowly lift the veil of darkness, must slowly allow us to catch up and understand. And not only was the promise here for the disciples, but there was a fourth part in this. Who else was included in this regathering of his people? Well, us. The believers who believed but did not see. He says blessings to us because he knew that through this gospel we would be given the story. And even though we didn't go through the emotional turmoil, even though we didn't put ourselves through the pain and the anguish, many of us, I think, at times have said, boy, I wish I could have met Jesus in person. Show of hands. But here's the thing. If you had met Jesus in person, that meant you would have had to go through this firsthand. Now, I look forward to meeting him in person on his timetable. But I'm so glad that I was able to meet him in scripture and in worship prior to that. So that I could open my eyes and get used to it. You see, in these verses, what Jesus did was he slowed down the inertia. Now let me ask you this. Anybody ever been a passenger in a car that was going a little bit too fast? On an off-ramp? Yes. How did inertia work out for you? Matter of fact, I can remember as a kid, when we were growing up, my dad used to take those pretty quickly. And I had an older brother, and I'll tell you what, the worst ones were he was on the wrong side of me, and he let that inertia kick in. And I got real close to that little side window. Didn't work out so well when I tried it the other way. But the point is, is that our God is a gracious God. He knows our needs. He knows how to bring us along and to help us out. And inertia is one of those things that if you're not ready for it, it can throw you. Again, on the submarine, we used to have these drills where the boat would make really fast turns, supposedly evading torpedoes. You know, and I got to tell you, the first time they mentioned that, I thought, you know, when I signed up for this, I really didn't think people were really going to be shooting at us. But I'll tell you what. Before they did those drills, they would announce it. And the reason for that, I tell you right now, if you're standing up on a watch station and most of the things around you are metal, you want to be 
forewarns that you can grab a hold of something because the first time that submarine ever took a quick turn, I felt the force. I would have been slung off. I think about watching people drive speed boats, you know, going skiing for the first time. I remember when I was a teenager, our youth group had that, and they let uh, one of the younger adult leaders drive, and he decided he was going to sling somebody off who was, he had just lifted up. Well, he whipped that boat around, and he did. The person skiing, oh, they tumbled. But so did three people that were sitting on the back of the boat. You see, we need to be prepared for the twists and the turns of life. And what had caused this inertia, what had caused this problem that the disciples had to be recovered from, it was the tragedy. Now I think these stories are told not just so we can understand them better, but it is for us too. Has anybody in here experienced tragedy? Loss? Sorrow? Grief? And when we experience these things, it brings chaos into our lives and it pushes us in directions. Sometimes directions away from where we want to be. And away from who we've taught, been taught to be and who we've been taught to trust in. And just like the disciples, the circumstances and the situations around us begin to drive us. Have you ever heard the term that perception is reality? Okay, I, I'm getting a few head nods. They used to say that in the, in the military all the time. And, you know, here's the sad fact. We all know it too because, you know, what's, what's the thing that you guard growing up? Your reputation. Because its reputation takes a lifetime to build and a few moments to destroy. Because perception is thought to be reality. But what's the truth of that? Is perception reality? Absolutely not. I mean, I like a good magic show too, but I know for a fact when they make the 747 disappear, it didn't disappear. They did some sort of illusion. When they picked the card that I thought of, it's not because they read my mind, it's because they had some way to warp my perception. And that's what life does. Life sometimes bends our perception and it uses chaos, and it uses pain, and it uses suffering, and it uses fear. And it drives us to places that we don't need to go, and that we don't want to be, and that Christ doesn't want us to be. And so he has provided in these stories, the remedy, the understanding that even when we go off path, even when we lock ourselves in our room for fear of whatever, even when we cut ourselves off from the truth that he has proclaimed to us and don't acknowledge that Christ has been risen for us, that Christ has come for us, that Christ offers salvation to us, when we forget these things because the world warps our perception, Jesus steps in and he brings us back from the brink. He gives us, like he gave the disciples, some perspective. Now he may not appear to us in bodily form, but have you ever, at the right time, had someone say a word that was so profound and kind that it just cut through the pain in your heart and gave you a second, a moment, a perception of joy? That suddenly, in darkness, you began to see the hope of light when the rest of the world when it seems like everything is just coming in that suddenly you have the hope that I will get through this I'm not gonna like it I don't ever want to do it again but I will be delivered from this just as Christ delivered his disciples from the darkness of Good Friday that through the slow and steady recalling and reappearing he rebuilt their hope. He restored their faith. He allowed the light not to come in blindingly, but in a way that was warm and illuminating, that slowly engulfed them and helped them over the course of the next 50 days, because we know that from Easter to Pentecost, Christ continued to re come to them. And what more? That even when he said, now I finally must go to my Father, but I will not leave you orphaned. I will give you the Holy Spirit. And so the story of Easter is the story of the Father fulfilling his promise. 
of a future in his kingdom. Of Jesus Christ establishing that promise by coming and taking upon himself our sin. Dying in our stead and coming back and explaining what it meant and where we are going. And then ultimately it comes from the enabling power of the Holy Spirit which he gives to us and allows his church to believe and understand things that we cannot possibly even comprehend outside of the fact of the Holy Spirit. It's no wonder that the disciples didn't get it right away because quite frankly it's unthinkable. It's unknowable. We cannot get there on our own. And God knew this. In our confession today it talked about perfection. Is perfection what God requires of us? It's a strict question. Don't answer too quick. Because the answer is yes. God requires and demands perfection of us because God is perfect and holy. But God also knows that for mankind it is impossible. Therefore, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is impossible for man, but it is possible for God. And God has provided us that. We, through our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to our acceptance and reception of the Holy Spirit, are driven forward and onward. No, in this world we will not be perfect. In this time, we will still find ourselves locked behind doors of fear and pain and grief and many other things that this world will try to tempt us with or bend our perception. But the liberating key is always found in the same place. In the life, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Therefore, rejoice in the good news. We are an Easter people. This is an Easter church. And the resurrection, well, is part of God's plan in our salvation. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father God, I give you thanks and praise again for the chance to go through your story. To be reminded of your grace and your mercy. Your endless love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we have been redeemed. Through the Holy Spirit, we have been able to confess. By your very will, we exist. So in all these things, we give you the glory and the honor. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God. Amen, amen. and amen. I now invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, Trust and Obey. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we have gathered in the house of the Lord to worship in spirit and in truth. We have heard his word rightly proclaimed. Therefore, through the power of the Holy Spirit, receive the peace of Christ which passes all understanding. May he be and abide in you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen? Amen. And amen. Go in peace to love and serve our Lord.